you're watching The Verdict here on Racing TV, a warm welcome to you all. We've got six races to analyse this week. We'll take you from Market Raisin to a very good card at Haydock Park, and we'll go to Gowron Park as well. Some top class action and some very interesting performances. And it's at Market Raisin where we start Thursday afternoon, the final race. It was a bumper over two miles and 125 yards and Springwell Bay was the 8 to 11 favourite here ahead of Sister Michael, who was well backed actually, a 7 to 2 shot. We'll pick him out, the winner, Springwell Bay, at the start, and then we'll put this performance into some sort of context. He exits a very good bumper, the Goffs bumper in Ireland, the 3rd, 4th, 5th and 7th have all won since running in that. He's now won, he finished second there. And subsequently, having finished second, he was bought for €155,000 and joined the John Joe O'Neill team, John Joe O'Neill Jr. on board here, back from a bad injury. And this horse, I think, looks very well bought indeed. You wouldn't get him for €155,000 now. You'd have to go double that, I think. Watch what he does here. He quickens clear in impressive fashion. He shows a fine turn of foot, the final three furlongs, was 40.15 seconds, absolutely destroying his rivals. They didn't go mad, they were just an even gallop, a normal bumper gallop, but he sprinted clear. And those final three furlongs he's done whilst being eased down from just before the furlong pole by John Joe O'Neill Jr. This was hugely impressive. His 16th furlong, the penultimate furlong of 12.92 seconds, really put the race to bed. And I think this is a, a horse that we can really, really follow. He's going to be perhaps a champion bumper horse. That might be the route that John Joe O'Neill wants to go, but it's not a race that he has many runners in historically. Since 2011, he's had a couple and they were both well beaten. So perhaps it's not necessarily a race that he targets, but he's got a very smart prospect on his hands. It's a rarity for a bumper horse to be able to show the sort of turn of foot that he displayed here at Market Raisin, and he was rated down in the closing stages to win as he liked under John Joe O'Neill Jr. You could not fail to be impressed visually what he did, and the clock backs that up. How do we sum up his performance overall? Well, he's a very smart prospect. There's absolutely no doubt about that. He's well bought at 155,000 uh, euros after running well in that bumper in Ireland. Gay Smith uh, bought him. Final three furlongs, really impressive. Uh, he was eased down, of course, but he came home in 40.15 seconds. That's, that's pretty good, and that really destroyed his rivals uh, in behind. Real good turn of foot for a bumper horse, I thought. Uh, he cruised throughout the race. He was always on the bridle. John Joe Neal Jr. waited till they swung in down the hill at Market Race, and then he quick and clear, and um, that will see him uh, to good effect over hurdles, I think, when eventually he goes over hurdles. He'll have too much speed for a lot of hurdlers. One of the most exciting prospects of the season so far. Uh, don't say that lightly. We've seen some really good performances already this season. We're going to see plenty more here on The Verdict this time around. But this horse, make no mistake, he is very good indeed. Possibly the champion bumper, maybe. It's an obvious target for him, not one that John Joe frequents very often but he might have a go with this fella, and if he does, he might just win it. Let's turn our attentions to an excellent card at Haydock on Saturday now, and we'll start with the listed hurdle that got the card underway. It was over just shy of two miles. Uh, novices in action, and seven to four, Barry Keller, who'd been impressive at Bangor when he had won on his previous start. He was uh, backed in from nine to four. It's good to laugh was nine to four. And Sonny Gino was 100 to 30, it was 6 to 1, and bigger the rest. I wanted to highlight uh, this particular contest because I wanted to just have a look at what Brian Hughes did here. I thought it was a, a tremendous effort from Brian from the front, judging the pace to perfection. And to a degree, he stole the race. Uh, send them on their way here, and uh, Barry Kello makes all the running. And it was just an even, but fairly steady early gallop. Uh, from uh, Brian Hughes, but then he committed very aggressively from four furlongs out. That's what the course track sectionals say, and to a degree he caught his rivals napping. Now look at where the second and third are at this point. He's there, doing his own thing out in front. There's the second, 
and there's the third. They're spotting in what, six, seven lengths at this stage. Brian Hughes has been able to get very much his own way out in front. But when he kicks, he definitely steals the race. And that is here. He goes early. He doesn't wait till they turn in and then sit for a count of 10 or 20. He goes on the bend and he's got them at it. He's got 10 lengths on the runner up here who's been caught napping in behind. The Son and Gina who finishes third likewise. And this horse is sprinting up the home straight. If we look at what he's doing, well, that'll tell us the 14th furlong, 12.24. He was really rolling at that stage. The 13th furlong was 12.46. Hughes winding it up in the home straight. He's stolen six, seven, eight lengths turning in, having dictated a steady gallop. This was a brilliant front running ride from Brian Hughes. I'm not sure the form is worth a great deal, but Barry Kello from a tremendous yard, the Donald McCain yard, they're going great guns at the moment and have been all season, has taken this race in good style. He did roughly the same thing when he won at Bangor on his previous start. And okay, he's never gonna get a trip like this again in his life. They're never gonna let him loose like this and Brian Hughes be allowed to kick and steal a march on his rivals, but he's still pretty useful nonetheless. This horse was um, not very good earlier in his career. He was naught from six, and then he had a break, a long break. He had 223 days off, and they did a wind operation, and he's not looked back since that. Clearly his breathing was an issue in the early part of his career, but they've got it sorted, and now Banger and here, at Haydock with this listed success. And he said that he's a pretty good novice. It would be wrong to underestimate him and one should definitely not underestimate the ride from Brian Hughes. He's just stolen a valuable listed contest at Haydock Park and, and done it very well indeed. A brilliant ride from Brian. So let's sum up what happened out there at Haydock early on. Perhaps it's important to remember that it was the tight inner circuit where speed matters. Speed matters more than anything on the tight inner hurdles track at Haydock, and he's got plenty of it. Brian went an even gallop early on, but from four out, he was gone. He was away aggressively turning into the home straight, and that won in the race. How do we know that? Well, we know it from the course track sections because he kicked the 13th furlong 1246, the 14th 1224, and that just blew the race apart completely. He was eight, nine, ten lengths clear of the second and third, just not long after turning in. I don't think it's a strong race. That point has to be made. Um, but the winner was, was impressive. He was on his seasonal reappearance. It might not have been very strong, but he's progressing pretty quickly, this novice. He's improved the season. I highlighted that he was naught from six. He's long layoff, wind surgery. They got him sorted out which is testament to uh, excellent training performance from Donald McCain. And as far as Donald is concerned, what a season he is having. We should really note that and give him praise for it. 24% strike rate this year, claiming 71 winners in total. That is a tremendous effort from Donald McCain. This was a front running masterclass from Brian Hughes. Time now here on The Verdict to look at a most exciting novice chaser from the Paul Nichols Yard, the name Brave Man's Game, and he was a facile winner at Haydock Park on Saturday. This is how they bet for the double daily rewards with Betfair graduation chase. It was over two miles, five and a half, and he was the eight to 13 favorite itchy feet. A grade one winner in the past, the distant past, however, was three to one. Fives pay the piper and Alna Dam was 20 to one, and this was a flawless performance from a brilliant novice. Let's send them on the way and jump the first couple of fences and then we'll move to a little bit later on in the race. What's the first thing uh, we should say about this race? Well, this was his second chase start to Brave Man's Game and his jumping was superb, absolutely brilliant. There he goes, pinging the first, jumping it better than Itchy Feet. Now look at the gallop they're going, it's not that quick. The finishing speed percentage 100.92, suggesting it was just an evenly run affair. Harry Coblin getting it absolutely spot on from the front, judging the pace to perfection. But that's not why he won, really. He won because he was miles better than his rivals. Look at him sauntering clear here. Itchy feet, 
not looking, well, not looking like he fancies it in behind, to be honest. Trying to lug in behind Brave Man's game, not jumping as well as Brave Man's game, who got in close to one fence in the home straight, but he was really clever when he did so, and impressive in motoring away from that fence thereafter. But most fences he took in his stride, he pinged them. His 21st furlong was 14.86 seconds, but he did it while he was on the bridle. He could have gone quicker, but he was much better than his rivals. Itchy Feet's running on, don't be fooled by that. He didn't look like he fancied it at all for much of the race, and he's not the horse that he was a few years ago. And look at Harry Cobden's body language as he comes up at the home straight. He's not moving a muscle. This horse knows exactly what he's doing. You don't have to organize him at his fences. He just goes in, jumps them. The horse himself sees a stride. He pops them and he's a tremendous prospect. He really is. He's already a grade one winning hurdler, of course. He ran well in the Albert Barlett over hurdles last season behind uh, Bob Ollinger and perhaps they're going to be set to meet at some point and that would be a tremendous race if we could see them taking each other on at some point. This is not a very strong novice event with, with itchy feet not really at his best but Brave Man's game's just won as he liked. It's just an exercise canter for him out there and you could not fail to be really impressed with what he did. He's jumping his main asset I think. So let's sum up what we saw on Saturday afternoon. It was an evenly run affair. He didn't go mad out in front. Itchy Feet tried to go with him. And at one point, Gavin Sheehan served it up to him just before turning in. But that horse didn't jump well enough to stay with Brave Man's game, who gained momentum and distance at every single fence. Evenly run, and the finishing speed percentage tells us just how well judged it was by Harry Cobden. I think he's a tremendous race horse. He's tractable. He doesn't pull hard. You can settle him where you want. I don't think he'd have to lead. You can do whatever you want with him. And he jumped brilliantly. He's a superb jumper. He does not need organising whatsoever. He really is a tremendous prospect. Just wanted to highlight uh, where he picked up in the home straight. It was the, the 21st furlong, 14.86 seconds. It's not particularly relevant because he didn't really have to pick up and sprint because Itchy Feet wasn't going forward and all he had to do was just maintain a gallop. But that just shows you uh, what he was doing in the home straight. And that was good enough. It was much quicker than all the rest. Racing TV website, have a look at all the sectionals. You'll see that you can put that in context. It was miles quicker than what anything else was doing in the race. Not a strong race on the balance of things, but what you've got to do when you look at these races sometimes is not analyse what a horse has beaten, but one, what he did on the clock, and two, visually, how impressive was he? And uh, the clock was pretty good, and he was visually very impressive indeed. Why wasn't it such a strong race? Because Itchy Feet didn't really perform. Grade one winning hurdler, so one would have thought he can translate that to, to fences. I would have thought a grade one success over fences is imminent. Paul Nichols is going very well, isn't he? We highlighted uh, how well Donald McCain is going. Well, Paul Nichols this year, he operates at a 29% strike rate. That is some going for the champion trainer. And this horse, he could be a champion. Let's have a look at the 225 at Haydock on Saturday, which was the Betfair Exchange Stayers Handicap Hurdle. It's thrown up some very good winners this race in the past. It was over three miles and 58 yards, and right place, right time from the Emmett Mullins yard. The Irish Raider was 11 to 4 favourite. Orbeez Legend was 9 to 2. Bass Rock 13 to 2. It was 15 to 2. And bigger, the rest is a very interesting performance from the winner, number 9, Don Levant, who wins for Evan Williams' daughter, Isabel was on board. Let's send them on their way and then we'll pick him up. He's always held up uh, this horse. He needs things to drop right and over lesser trips they have not dropped right for him in recent races. Here he is just picking him up there held up in rear uh, by Isabel. Riggs is just in there. He'll be held up as well. He'll be wrangled back towards the rear in a moment or two. We'll carry on at just the start here. We've identified where the winner is. The pace was was pretty good on this tight inner track once again. It's a speed track, it suits uh, Don Levant, who was trying this trip for the very first time. He's ne not really many times had races run to suit him. But up in trip here, because 
Isabel advised Father Evan that that's what they should do. And look at the way he travels through this contest. There he is. He's cruising into contention. Riggs is just in front of him and he's going to be delivered perfectly to go and sprint clear of his rivals. These final three furlongs were pretty good. 41.08. He's come home very strongly. He's a fast horse and three miles on this speed track really suited him. It was right up his street. Watch him pick up now after he's jumped the last and he'll go past Riggs. Bass Rock is the horse against the rail in the green. Did best of those horses who were ridden prominently, but the first two were held up. And Don Levant, well, he's got what he wanted here. Decent ground, a hold up ride as they always do with him and a step up to three miles for the very first time. And he was perfectly delivered as well by Isabel Williams. In fact, Evan Williams, the trainer, was quite rightly uh, fairly emotional after uh, this particular success. The pace did collapse a bit if the cap fits uh, set out to make the running. He's dropping away in the, the green colours towards the inside. And Bass Rock, well, he's a winner in waiting for me. Racing TV tracker for Bass Rock because he did very well having been up with that strong gallop throughout. But Don Levant has come of age. He got what he wanted here and there could now be more to come from him. He won here off a mark of 135. Well, who knows uh, where he'll go next. Maybe always a sharp three miles is going to be what he wants. He'll certainly always want a decent gallop to go out because he's invariably held up. In fact, over two miles they've been dropping him out as well and he's never been seen with a, with a chance when that's happened but over this trip on the fast track it really suited him so how do we sum up what uh, what happened here a valuable prize for uh, isabel williams and for her father as well but the step up in trip a patient ride brought about this career best uh, from this nice looking individual strongly run race that's what he wants he wants them to go hard he wants them to stop in front of him and he got just that and um, bass rock do make a note of him best of those it was ridden handily. Steady headway uh, from four furlong out. And look at this. This is interesting, isn't it? He was the quickest through every furlong from there on. So the last four furlongs, if you analyse the course track sections, they're there on the Racing TV website. Those last four furlongs, he was quicker than every other horse in the race. More potential at the trip. I don't think he'd want to slog in the mud over three miles or further. Not sure three miles at Cheltenham would necessarily suit him. They might be thinking of the stayers hurdle, but I think there's more to come from him, granted the sort of setup and conditions he got this time around. Brilliant success, wasn't it? Evan Williams, uh, he was very quick to praise his daughter, Isabel. He said he's done a lot of work with this horse and advised him to run this fella over three miles. It was a family affair out there at Haydock. Let's turn our attentions now here on the verdict to the big race of the day on Saturday at Haydock, the Betfair Chase. A rare Irish raider was favourite. They've not had many runners historically in this race, but they did this time around, and it was Aplutar, the Gold Cup runner-up, who was 11 to 10 favourite for Rachel Blackmore and Henry de Bromhead. Bristol Demai, looking to win this race for a fourth time, was 11 to 4. Royal Pagai, most progressive individual last season, 13 to 2. Waiting patiently now with Christian Williams, 15 to 2. Imperial Aura. The 12 to 1 shot for Kim Bailey and Week in the market. Chatham Street Lad, 28 to 1, and Clondor Castle, 33s. So just shy of three and a quarter miles for the, the Betfair Chase. Usually run on pretty deep ground at this time of year at Haydock Park, but not this time around. Um, pretty good conditions for the Betfair Chase, unseasonably good. And it was Aplutar who won this race as he liked. It was a tremendous performance uh, from him. I think it's worth putting the race into context uh, though. I don't think it was particularly strong and it to some degree fell apart. You have to make note of that. But that takes nothing away from how visually impressive Aplutar uh, was. We've got them in the home straight now. We've got Royal Pagai out in front and there Rachel Blackmore has taken a pull. He, he was all for surging clear, jumping that fence, the Royal Pagai, and she has literally taken a pull and said, no way are we going anywhere. We're going to wait and attack when I want to. That's how well our Plutar was going. Bristol Demai at this stage, completely gone. Tratham Street Lad trying to get involved, not good enough. 
and Aplutar, when Rachel Blackmore says go, surges clear and wins, perhaps you'd say, as he should. Officially, he was rated 172, six pounds and plus higher than all of his rivals. So you'd say, well, he should have beaten them, but he's absolutely annihilated them. Why has he done that? Because he's a superb, improving chaser, trained by a brilliant trainer in Henry de Bromhead and ridden by a fantastic jockey in Rachel Blackmore. But you've got to say the race fell apart a little bit. Bristol de Mai didn't get the softest ground that he really likes. Uh, Royal Pagai, well, he was exposed in the Gold Cup and I think exposed once again. And Chatham Street lads, just not up to this class whatsoever. And Aplutard saunters clear for a hugely impressive success under uh, Rachel Blackmore. And it's really just like a prep race for him because he just didn't have a hard time of it out there whatsoever. Some felt that Imperial Aura might have got involved. He fell down the back, he got up okay. Not sure that he would have bothered Aplutar, who sauntered home. The final three furlongs, 43.41. Now that's not particularly quick, but when put in context, you can see why the race fell apart. 43.41 for him. Royal Pagaya finished second, just around about five seconds slower through the final three furlongs, 48.01. He was not going forward at all in second place. He was treading water a bit. So Aplutar didn't have to run fast in the last three furlongs to put away his main rival. The race falling apart at the seams, but won by a horse who could go on to be tremendously good. He's young yet, he's only seven. There could be loads more to come. He could be the next Corto star. And I really hope he, he goes on. Uh, to prove that he is a superstar. This race doesn't prove that. Proves he's in really good heart and in very good form indeed and that he's going to be a huge force in the Cheltenham Gold Cup for which he's favourite again now. And just look at him saunter clear there. Hugely impressive. But the race fell apart a little bit. I haven't highlighted the final three furlongs for you. There are any relevant when you, you compare them with what the others did, and the others being Royal Pagai, the run-up 48.01 as opposed to 43.41. And he did that a Plutar on the bridle. He was not pushed out very vigorously by Rachel Blackmore. Official ratings, well, look, he's six pounds higher than, than all of his rivals, so he, he should have beaten them, but he hasn't beaten them. He's absolutely torn them apart. He's thrashed them in the Betfair chase. Now, this is a, an interesting point, I think. I, th I believe his form has gone to a different level since they put a tongue tie on. Two grade ones and a second in the Gold Cup since that tongue tie went on. He's only worn it three times and that's what he's done while wearing it. He's the rightful favourite for the Cheltenham Gold Cup. I have absolutely no doubt about that. He deserves to be favourite on, on the back of that. And, and after all, he was very good in the race last year. What can happen this year? Well, he just could perhaps dominate the staying chase scene. It's possible that he'll be way better than all of his rivals. He certainly was way better than his Betfair chase rivals up in grade now for Aplutar. We saw Brave Man's game earlier on here on The Verdict. And now we're going to look at a horse who he might come up against at some point this season. And it is Bob Ollinger who made his chasing debut at Gowan Park over two and a half miles on Saturday afternoon. It was a very strong beginner's chase, given that you've got the likes of Bacardi's and Coccolino in there. Bob Ollinger, though, was fully expected to win on his chasing debut. He was a brilliant hurdler. He won the Albert Bartlett as he liked at the Cheltenham Festival last year. And he was sent off one to three to give Henry de Bromhead a big across the card double after Aplutar's success in the Betfair chase. So down at the start, we'll pick him out. There he is. Um, this race was just run at a steady gallop early on. I think jockeys anxious to get their mounts jumping well. Remember, it's a beginner's chase, so they didn't go mad. But he was always prominent and he jumped more than adequately, I think it would be fair to say. I think he, he was a little bit careful at a few of his fences, but he was pretty good overall. Now you can see they've picked up and quickened and they've got really strung out very quickly. And it's Bob that's stringing them out, along with Bacardi's, the Willie Mullins trained Bacardi's. 
who's turning his hand to chasing. Bob just stumbled on landing there. Not a mistake, just a bit of a stumble on landing because I think he was winging along at that stage and he had landed with a lot of momentum and he almost tripped himself up. Again, he jumps that better than Bacardi's in second place. Master McShee runs on for third, Coccolino back in fourth, but they're distant thirds and fourths for he has thrashed this field. Got in a bit close there, but he was all right. I think he was a little bit careful at some of his fences, just a little bit wary of some of them. And that minor error there at the last was the only discernible error that he made at all. But this is a very, very good horse. This was as good a beginner's chase as you're going to see, I think, uh, for a while. And he's thrashed Bacardi's, who was a really good hurdler in his own right. Now, he might not be as good a chaser. I didn't think he jumped particularly fluently. But there were some nice horses in behind, and Bob Ollinger has just cantered away from the lot of them. And if he beats, meets Brave Man's game, well, you'd be a brave man to say who's going to win that. But this programme's not about sitting on the fence. It's about having an opinion. And my opinion would be that Bob Ollinger would beat him. I think he would beat him. He beat him over hurdles, and I think he'll do so over fences and it was a superb ride wasn't it with Dara O'Keefe to pick up of course Rachel Blackmore this is her ride but she was on Aplutar at Haydock so she missed out on this occasion she'll be back on board wherever he goes uh, next time and he's a sort of novice that they could they could think about running in the Gold Cup I'm sure they won't I'm sure they'll stay the novice route for now Gold Cup next season but such is his potential that it must just cross their minds for a second or two. I don't think they'll go, go for that. He's going to need more experience, get a little bit more fluent at his fences. And if he does get more fluent, he's going to be incredibly hard to beat in this division. Right, so how do we sum that race up? Well, it was a very good race for the grade. It was a beginner's chase. The runner-up is a graded stakes hurdler. Now, Bacardi's, that is, didn't jump as well as Bob. But still, Bob Ollinger's beaten a very good horse into second place there. It was steady early on. Jockeys wanted to get the horses into a rhythm, get them jumping. Uh, they're new at this game, so they wanted to get them jumping well. Um, but it really did pick up just after halfway. Bob Ollinger was part of the reason it did pick up. And he sprinted clear of his rivals. And they finished really well strung out on account of that pace injection from Bob Ollinger at halfway. He was careful at some of his fences, but he was pretty accurate. Small minor error at the, at the last, when he was sort of eased back a little bit just to pop it. He was really winging at the second last, and that's when he tripped on landing and stumbled a, a little bit. That's, I think, because he was really flying at that point, and Jockey Derek Keefe did really well to just, just get him back, really, and get him back on his hocks coming down to the last. I think he's going to be incredibly hard to beat in this fear. I think he's one of the most talented horses in training out there. And I do think it'd be impossible to be as long as his jumping holds up. For me, he's a Gold Cup horse in waiting. They won't go that route, I wouldn't have thought this year. He's going to need a bit more, bit more experience, isn't he? And a real season chasing under his belt before they think about uh, that kind of thing. But, but surely he is a Gold Cup horse in waiting. And for my money, He's the most exciting horse there is in the National Hunt game at the moment. I think he is a tremendous prospect and he certainly excites me going forward. I cannot wait to see Bob Ollinger once again and I can't wait to see him take on Brave Man's game. Well, it was a privilege to analyse some of those races that we saw last week uh, here on The Verdict. Aplutard, Imperius in the Betfair chase. Brave man's game. You won't see a novice put in a better round of jumping than he did at Haydock Park. And Bob Ollinger just so exciting. And this jumps game is really ramping up now. See you next time. Racing TV, 100% of our profits go back into racing. Thank you for supporting the sport that we all know and love.